Hello, everyone. I'll do that again. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Today, I carry this label, social change leader. And I carry this label because of an initiative I took 20 years ago. In response to the global landmine problem, I started training rats to save human lives by detecting landmines. And what started as a crazy research project became an international NGO with a huge impact in the global south. Today, more than a million subsistence farmers in the global south have been able to return to their villages and lead a life free of fear, thanks to these wonderful hero rats. But my story today is not about rats, and it is not about landmines either. Today, I want to look at the backside of social change. I want to talk about social change leaders in general and how we relate to ourselves and how we engage in our societal work. So seen from a personal perspective, this entrepreneurial journey was a 20 year roller coaster where I was really hard on myself, where I put a lot of pressure on myself and on my team to deliver our promise for a better world. And even if we had the most peaceful intentions, this journey mostly felt like a struggle, like a fight. We worked under huge pressure, operational pressure, pressure from the donors. We worked under a permanent scarcity of funding. And we had a huge burden from staff turnover, lack of engagement among our staff, and lots of burnouts. The social change space is all about innovation, about strategy, about impact, about scale, and it requires an almost supernatural 24-7 performance of these social change leaders. On top of this pressure, it is almost taken for granted that we are obsessed by our ID. But isn't obsession a psychiatric syndrome? Are we trying to solve the world's issues in the right way? Or would it be possible that unconsciously we carry our anger, our fear, and our dark complexities into our actions in the world? And by doing so, propel what we desperately try to defeat. In other words, what is the relationship between our inner development and the quality and effectiveness of our actions in the world? A number of us in the social change space had noticed that there was this deep threat that needed to be addressed. And that led to one of us going to Ashoka, one of the key social change networks to start exploring this issue by interviewing 50 social change leaders around the globe. The research showed that a large majority of them had never made time for personal work. They had worked their asses off while ignoring not only their personal needs, but also their family needs, their colleagues' needs, and in some cases, even their organizational needs. Most of these leaders over-identified with their work. And quite often, there were unhealthy narratives of heroism, sacrifice, martyrdom around these leaders. Their reason of existence had become their work, and they would sacrifice their own well-being 
to play a hero role on stage. In many cases as well, there was a personal trauma that had originally ignited their entrepreneurial journey. And while the white public was applauding for the innovation and the impact, these leaders didn't learn healthy ways to work with their trauma, let alone to open up to their vulnerability. These trends were pretty clear, but they were an insufficient data set to form a basis for decision making to make the sector, the culture in the sector around social change healthier. But it triggered a keen interest to look deeper into the matter. And a number of key spearheading organizations in social innovation, like Ashoka, like the Skoll Foundation, like the Impact Hub, SLN, the Fetzer Institute, and Synergos, joined forces and co-created the Wellbeing Project. And this coalition works together to shift the culture in the field of social change to a more caring and compassionate one, to respond to the huge need for personal support among social change leaders, to respond to this huge need and to research the relationship between inner work and social change, and to explore with the entire sector an infrastructure of support for the future. And by doing so, the Wellbeing Project actually created a whole different way to look at social change work. One that works from the inside outwards, but certainly by addressing what lives within us first. 60 seasoned social entrepreneurs from around the globe, they were from 45 countries, they were selected for a one and a half year program in which they could prioritize on their inner journeys. The program consisted of three retreats, a customized personal support program, wisdom teachers, the best facilitators, and peer learning, a high quality program for these people who, for many of them, was the first time they could ever do inner work. So they went on this journey in three cohorts of 20. And for one and a half years, they prioritized on their personal well-being over their work. In each cohort, there were researchers embedded. They participated and they collected data for a longitudinal developmental evaluation study which measures the relationship between inner development and the quality and effectiveness of social change work. By now, we have compelling evidence that there is indeed a profound relationship. There is a profound connection between the inner and the outer. And by demonstrating that, the Wellbeing Project has actually created the basis for a whole new field of research. There is so much more to learn. But what we've learned so far is pretty extraordinary. We've seen shifts both in the personal and work environments of these participants. Generally, they became more balanced, more aware of their personal needs, and they listened to them, which made them healthier and happier folks. They integrated this sensibility and this approach into the relationship they had with their work, putting clear boundaries around this, which in return created sufficient recovery time and family time. In their work environment, these people learned to share their leadership in more horizontal ways throughout the organization. So they built more trust among their colleagues. They were capable of showing up more fully present in any given situation. They were more approachable, and they learned to listen deeply. They embraced 
an emergent learning culture, more collaboration, and flatter structures throughout the cultures of their organizations. As a result, there was more engagement among their staff, less staff turnover, all of this contributing to the sustainability of their work and their impact. Thus, real lasting change perhaps starts within each and every one of us. Or to put it in the words of the Turkish poet Rumi, yesterday I was clever and I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise and I want to change myself. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges we face as a humanity are complex, they are many, and they are urgent. We cannot afford to lose hope or to become bitter. I would argue that the path towards inner well-being is the most direct and effective way to solve the world's most pressing social and environmental challenges. In other words, inner well-being inspires well-doing. Thank you very much.